the event for tonight. And then, um, oh gosh, event. Where do I find events? I put a link in the chat actually. Okay. okay, we have two more minutes before we start. I see a post that has a link. Yeah, um, what happened? Mm. Should I click on it? Because I'm, I don't know if that will mess me up since I'm already there. Can you ask your husband to try it? <laughs> mm. Yeah, he may not have. Um, he's currently somewhere in a sandbox with my son, but I'll see if he can. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's difficult for us to try the link since we're already in. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, one more minute. One minute. We're going to try it here on a uh, mobile phone to see if it works. Mm. Yeah, almost there. I'm good. I always get really, really nervous like the minute before, and I just want to run away. <laughs> Okay, uh, it's 5.30 uh, and we are supposed to start now. We have uh, my colleague Jenny here, I see, and a guest. We're hoping that more people will join us, uh, but I'm going to start anyway. Uh, just going to be... Okay, so welcome to the Gothenburg Natural History Museum, uh, or at least this digital <laughs> evening at, at Microsoft Teams. Um, this is a digital event called What Does Jenga Have to Do with Ecosystem Collapse? It's a part of the Hållbarhetsfestivalen. This is a sustainability festival. It takes place this week in the region of Västra Götaland. And this event is arranged by us at the Gothenburg Natural History Museum and the GGBC, the Gothenburg Global Biodiversity Center. And we do have an exciting evening ahead of us, uh, I think at least, and I think you do too. Uh, and just remember to keep your microphones off when uh, during the talks, and then we can have a few discussions after the talks or in between talks. Um, you can ask questions in the chat room or in the chat. My colleague Fredrika is going to keep an eye on that. And we will also record this evening so we can put it out on our website afterwards for the people who couldn't join us today. Um, and I'm not going to say anything more actually because I have nothing interesting to say compared to the people that are with me tonight. So I'm going to give the floor to Ola, uh, educator here at the museum. You're on. Thank you. Yes, my name is Ola Brusehed and I'm a teacher at the Natural History Museum in Gothenburg. And um, the question is, what does a game of Jenga has to do with ecosystem collapse? Quite a lot, actually. The entire world is just one big ecosystem. We used to call it the biosphere. And but if, if we look really, really close, we can see there are different kinds of ecosystems. We can find oceans. There are deserts, rainforests. If we look close, we have lakes, rivers, and many kinds of different ecosystems. And they all depend on each other. And if we look even closer, all these ecosystems consist of millions and millions of species. We have animals and plants and bacteria and fungi and many things. 
And many of these things, species don't even have a name. Some say that most species don't even have a name. We don't know what's there. And what we are doing right now um, in the world, we are playing a game of Jenga with the world. And this is the this is the Jenga game. And what ha what's happening is that we lose species. Species are going extinct. And we can wonder uh, what happens when a species go extinct, when it disappears. So if we take one species away, maybe nothing happens. We, uh, we notice nothing and we keep doing this. Um, we don't, most of the time, we don't even see the species going extinct. And sometimes, sometimes if we look very, very close, we can see that there is a, there's a small piece missing right there. There's a small piece missing. But if we look at the piece, we can see that it's actually quite big. So whenever we see one part missing, uh, it's probably a lot more. And we keep playing Jenga. We keep playing Jenga with the world. Uh, this ecosystem goes uh, goes away, and here's here's something else going away, and here's uh, the Judy bird. We know that that is gone, but well, I don't, I didn't notice anything. It was before my birth, but uh, it didn't affect us in Sweden, uh, we think. But we keep playing Jenga, and Jenga is a nice game. But you know what happens eventually if you play Jenga long enough. Um, someone is going to win and someone is going to lose. And if if you lose just the wrong, if you remove just the wrong piece, just the wrong piece of, of species, if you're unlucky enough, something will happen. And we don't want that to happen because that small ecosystem that goes extinct will cause something worse to happen. Maybe we can keep keep going for a while, but eventually it's the big ecosystem, it's the biosphere that goes away and we don't want that to happen. So that's the easy uh, answer to what Jenga has to do with ecosystem collapse. And um, over to you, René. Thank you so much, Ola. That was a really good way to show that we actually have no idea what we're doing. We think we can manage without a few pieces, but all of a sudden, poof, it's gone. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and I think you're going to leave us now. Yes, I'm, not yes I am. I'm going to take care of all the pieces. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> So yeah, that was a short introduction to kind of how it works that we have so many species in the world, we don't even know about most of them. And we think that, well, it doesn't matter, we can lose one or two species or a thousand or a million, I don't know, because we don't even know how many there are, we think there are just so many. But all of a sudden we lose just enough for everything to collapse or we lose one species that depends on so many others that it just totally collapses. Uh, and I'm going to give the floor now to Anne, and I think it's best that you introduce yourself. So, welcome. Okay, thank you. My name is Anne Bjorkman. Oh, sorry, one second. Just recovering from a cold. Um, I am a senior lecturer at the University of Gothenburg in the BioInv department, and I study primarily um, the ecology of Arctic and Alpine ecosystems, so tundra ecosystems, um, and mostly plants. And so I'll share with you some of my work and also some work of colleagues um, related to this theme. Can you see okay? Great. So as I mentioned, I work primarily in the Arctic. So here's a lovely Arctic photo, some nice ice caps in the background. 
a glacial tundra stream and then some saxifraga appositifolia in the foreground, just barely hanging on in this um, melting glacial water. So why do I focus on the tundra? The tundra, as you probably know, is one of the most rapidly warming uh, places on the planet. This is especially true for the Arctic tundra. So this area up at the far north um, in the polar regions of our planet, but it's actually also true of, of alpine tundra. So the tops of mountains are actually experiencing much uh, more rapid warming than the rest of the world. And particularly in the Arctic tundra, this has some really important consequences or some potentially very important consequences for the entire globe. So um, recent studies have shown that the potential for carbon to be released into the atmosphere from the soil, so carbon that's currently stored in the soil, um, is much greater at these high latitude regions, so Arctic and, and, um, and subarctic regions. <clears throat> so this paper found that uh, the largest standing soil carbon stocks are the fast and the fastest expected rates of warming um, occur in the Arctic, and thus the, the overwhelming majority of warming-induced soil carbon losses are likely to occur in Arctic and subarctic regions. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that matters, um, but just to give you that that background. There's a lot of carbon stored in the soil in the Arctic, uh, in the Arctic tundra. This will be a tale of two tundras. So I'll talk about both Arctic and Alpine tundra. Um, the plants in these places are quite similar in terms of the way they look. Um, and there are very, and they're of course very similar habitats. So cold and no trees, the plants tend to be very short. And the major difference, at least in visual difference is that you know you see in this alpine backdrop the the mountains whereas in this arctic background you see the the ocean with icebergs floating in it so i'll start off talking a little bit about biodiversity change in the alpine region so specifically in european mountain summits and this is a study that i think is is really exciting and really cool it's based on historical surveys that were done by botanists more than 100 years ago. So basically just um, botanists who went out and they were really interested in plants. And so they hiked to the top of mountains and they wrote down in their notebooks what plants were there. Um, and this actually gives us a record of which species occurred on European mountains 130, up to 130 years ago. And they did this in almost all of the mountains of Europe. So if you look at this map here, you can see, um, of course, a lot of surveys in the Alps, but also in the Pyrenees and the Scandies, even on Svalbard and in Scotland. So we have actually really amazing records of which species, which plant species occurred on mountaintops um, up to 130 years ago. And this just shows you the span of those surveys. Um, and what colleagues and I've done is has gone back and resurveyed these mountaintops. So this will show you when the resurveys have been done. So we can actually look at how um, the diversity of these plant communities has changed over time on the tops of mountains in Europe. So you may be expecting to see some downward trends here, but actually, surprise, what we see is that there's a pretty dramatic increase in biodiversity over time. So, uh, for example, on the far left at this graph, here's 1900, here's the year 2000, and here's the change in the number of species over time. It starts out quite low, and then you get an increase of about 20 species over time in the more recent surveys. And it's true across all the different mountain regions of Europe. So we see this really, really rapid increase in the number of species on mountaintops. So there's actually an acceleration in the species richness increase over time in many cases. So in the early years, you see an increase, and then more recently, you see an even more rapid increase. In the Arctic tundra, we have similar but not so long-term records. So this is a map of where we have long-term monitoring plots, which are actually relatively short-term monitoring plots relative to what we have in the Alpine. Um, these go back about 30 years, but we can still look at how plant diversity has changed over the last 30 years in these places. So what we here, see here, so this is a bit of a different kind of graph. So here we have a count of sites over here. So there are about 118 sites in total. And here we have the richness change. So anything that's to the, to the right of this line means an increase in the number of species, and anything to the left means a decrease in the number of species. And what we say, see is that there's a slight increase 
but on average, there's no change. So across all the different sites, on average, there's no change in the number of species uh, in these Arctic sites. So is this the end of the story? I think you know that it's not, or else I wouldn't be here talking about ecosystem collapse. So if we dig a little bit deeper into this data, what we actually see, so we see these increases in total diversity and across all these different mountains in Europe, for example. But if we dig a bit deeper, what we really see, pay attention to this blue line here, is that for high alpine specialist species, the probability that they go extinct on these mountain summits is related to temperature change. So that says that as it gets warmer and warmer, these high alpine specialist species are more and more likely to go extinct. And similarly, so this is a measure of rarity on the x-axis here. So a one would be an extremely rare species that occurs on very few mountain summits. And the more rare a species is, the more likely it's to go extinct. So rare species are more likely to be lost and, how, and high alpine specialist species are more likely to be lost when it gets warmer. So potentially, even though we see in increases in diversity overall, what we're missing from that picture is that rare and high alpine specialist species are at potentially much greater risk of extinction, at least local extinction. A similar story applies for the Arctic. So again, we saw no change in species richness across all the sites that we looked at. But does no change in species richness mean that there's been no change? So does that really mean there's been no change in the way these ecosystems function and the services that they provide to people? So one thing that um, I spent a lot of time thinking about is what vegetation change in the Arctic and alpine tundra actually means in terms of the functioning of ecosystems. And one way of going about this is instead of looking at just the number of species, actually looking at what the characteristics or the traits of those species are. So I'm really interested in the idea of, of trait change um, that goes along with vegetation change in the Arctic. And traits are things like um, the size of leaves, the height, the height of a plant, when it flowers in the spring, when its leaves senesce or when the leaves die in the fall, uh, and then a whole bunch of other sort of more uh, technical measures like the content of the nitrogen in the leaves, how fast it can photosynthesize and things like that. So what we did, we went out and measured um, traits on a whole bunch of different species across the whole Arctic, well, across the whole sort of Northern hemisphere, I guess, in many cases. And we combined this with the data we have on how species composition has changed over time. So again, we have these nearly 10,000 monitoring plots where we look at the composition of species over 30 years, so how they changed over time. And we combine that with almost 56,000 trait measurements um, on seven different traits. And just to give you one example of the kind of things that we're seeing in terms of the sort of disconnect between the no change result we see when we look simply at the number of species and what we see when we look at changes in, in traits of vegetation. So one thing that we find that's really, really strong across all of these Arctic sites is that um, the way things change over time, so which species come into or go extinct from a plot is not random. It depends on how tall those species are. So this graph is a bit complicated, but it basically just shows that the taller a species is, the more likely it is to win over time. So the more likely it is to enter into a new site over time or invade a new site over time. And this actually means that we see a change in the entire community. So communities are actually getting taller over time. And this is again, <clears throat> just showing the number of different sites we have. So 118 different sites and anything to the right of this zero line means the community is getting taller over time. And as you can see, everything every single site is to the right of this line. So the increase in height of these tundra plant communities is really uh, strong and really pervasive. And of course, the key question now becomes, what is the consequence of this? What happens when we have increasing height, uh, such a strong increase in height across all these different sites? 
So that brings us to the question, how can vegetation change influence ecosystem functioning? Um, and so this is just one example. So canopy height. So here we have a little shrub, for example, but it can also be, it doesn't have to be a shrub, it can be any plant um, that is taller than the surroundings. And what this, what actually happens is that the snow piles up around the shrub. So it acts as a trap for snow. Um, so taller plants trap more snow. And as a result, this uh, leads to warmer soil temperatures. So because snow is so insulating, it actually insulates the soil underneath and prevents the soil from freezing as, as deeply and as cold, as coldly as it would have uh, if there were less snow. And this actually leads to um, permafrost thaw and increased rates of decomposition of, of leaves, for example, of leaf matter and other dead organic matter. And if you remember this graph from the beginning, we have potentially a great deal of soil carbon stored in these soils. So if you have decomposition of, of soils that releases carbon into the atmosphere, what you get is increased carbon in the atmosphere, which in turn leads to an increase in the air temperature, which creates this positive feedback loop to canopy height. So again, you get with warmer temperatures, you get taller plants, which then leads to increased carbon released from the soil, which leads to warmer temperatures, which leads to taller plants, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just one example of a positive feedback loop as a result of a change in the traits of these tundra plant communities. Another example, um, that the way canopy height can influence this is through the influence of height on albedo, which is just the reflectance of, of sunlight from the surface of the earth. So when you have snow, which is white, it reflects a large amount of the sunlight and that keeps things relatively cool. But when you have taller vegetation that sticks up above the level of the snow, it's much darker than the snow surface and it absorbs that sun, that solar radi radiation and makes things much warmer. So this actually leads to an increase in air temperature, which of course then again leads to an increase in canopy height and you get another positive feedback here. And one final example of how <clears throat> a change in the composition of the vegetation in the tundra can lead to a change in the way these ecosystems function. So this is an example of phenology, which is the timing of life events. So in this case, we're looking at the timing of flowering. So when the flowers open in the spring or in the summer. And what we see is that the sensitivity to temperature, so that just means that uh, if you or if you are sensitive to temperature, that means that you flower earlier when it's warmer. Um, whereas if you're not sensitive to temperature, then you, you don't respond to changes in temperature. You flower at the same time every year, regardless of what temperature it is. So how sensitive a species is to temperature <clears throat> depends on its phenological niche, which is simply when during the course of the summer it flowers. So early flowering species over here, the species that flower first, um, and late flowering species over here. And what we find is that late flowering species, so those that flower toward the end of the summer, they are very sensitive to temperature, so they flower earlier when it's warmer, whereas early flowering species are not sensitive to temperature, so they don't respond to variation in temperature. So greater temperature sensitivity in late flowering species. So how does that relate to ecosystem functioning? What we see then across sites is that <clears throat> as it gets warmer, we actually have the flowering season getting shorter because these late flowering species are flowering earlier, but the earlier flowering species aren't changing. And so the flowering window, the, fl the whole flowering season is actually getting shorter. And that's what this graph shows. So as it gets warmer, the change in the length of the flowering season is negative. So here it's getting shorter when it gets warmer. So the flowering season is shorter with warming. And this, of course, can have implications for pollinators. So we could potentially see uh, a decline in pollinators. And this, we don't have good records of this at every site, but we see at least in one site where we have good records of both flowering season um, and pollinator abundance, we see a decline in pollinators, potentially as a result of this shorter flowering season.
So just a few thoughts to summarize. We actually see kind of surprisingly um, to many, I think, that total diversity is not declining in the alpine or the Arctic tundra. But of course, if you stop there, you miss a big part of the picture. If we only care about total diversity chains, change, we miss the loss of species we care about. So for example, these rare alpine flowers, or we miss changes in species that are, that are important for ecosystem functioning. So that influence eco ecosystem functions we care about, such as the storage of carbon versus the release of carbon into the atmosphere. Tundra ecosystem function in particular um, is more likely to be impacted directly by shifts in composition. So for example, the immigration of tall species or changes in traits, for example, increases in height or, or changes in flowering time rather than through diversity change directly. And function matters. So as I've shown, changes in the composition and traits of vegetation can lead to positive feedbacks with climate warming, which means we could have uh, increased warming as a result of the change we see that is a result of climate warming already. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne. That was very interesting. Um, I think it's if you can, can you go back, go oh, back sorry. one slide. Oh, yes. <laughs> I wasn't fast enough because um, I was thinking yes, the, the thing that it, when you present your information like okay, so the increase um, total diversity is not declining, um, and I think there's a risk that people will stop there. <laughs> like yeah, it's not declining. So have you met? any of this like okay so it's not declining so we don't have to worry or do people actually listen to the whole story i find that people listen to the whole story because the the sort of the true implications are even scarier than the loss of diversity in and of itself potentially so you know this positive feedback the potential for a positive feedback with climate warming has global implications in terms of of really dramatic um, future warming and and of course that as we know, comes with all sorts of negative uh, negative um, implications for you know our food systems, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I, I find that that is is almost um, more compelling than just a loss of you know some species in the Arctic that nobody really cares about. And for for I think for people also that uh, not for people not having. Um, as much information if someone says that yeah it's going to be more snow then you would think it's going to be colder but more snow means warmer soil and permafrost thaw so it's also like the first thing you might think is actually the opposite of what's going to happen yeah so it's yeah about... there's there's a lot in the in the arctic and in the tundra in general that sort of goes against the the common story so we typically see that even though it's getting warmer we we often see more snow in many places because warmer weather or warmer climate holds more moisture and typically the arctic is extremely cold in the winter so the air is extremely dry but as it gets a bit warmer it can actually hold more moisture and so we actually get more snow in some cases oh wow okay james you put your hand up so you can put your microphone on uh just a like very nice talk i was just curious about so I have two questions about the resurveys of the mountains. Yeah. So of course the like when they originally surveyed them, they have a list of presences of species that what they recorded. Um, but they don't have it's it's probably incomplete and probably their methods uh, were not easy to fully replicate. Um, so do you think that at least some of the increases in diversity that you're seeing there are just perhaps better sampling by uh, the, the more recent surveys, or do you think those results are pretty robust to sampling effort? We we thought about this a lot, and our our feeling is that it, actually that is the, the sort of the least of the concerns mm. in terms of um, in terms of these resurveys. So first of all, the botanists who went up these mountains were generally very very good botanists and mm. very thorough. We also have um, intermediate surveys from many of these mountains. And so we know that, you know, halfway between the first survey and the most recent survey, there was an intermediate survey and they almost always sort of line up with this uh, increase in diversity over time. So mm. the middle steps don't go, you know, they don't show a decline in diversity or a huge jump 
right at the beginning, they're sort of halfway in between as we would expect them to be if this were a gradual change over time. Um, there, are, there are other potential issues with these, these historic data, mostly regarding um, the, the exact area that they surveyed. So in general, they, they surveyed you know, the top 10 meters of a mountaintop, but it can be a bit tricky to, to know how exactly they decided what cutoff point that was. So when we do the resurveys, of course, we might include like a slightly larger area or slightly smaller area um, than what they included. So I think that's the bigger challenge um, with, the, with the historic data. Um, yeah, and then my second question was, so you have the, the plots that show that total diversity is not declining, but these are in the individual plots, yes. I guess. So, but what you also see is that some of the sort of warmer adapted species are coming in. Yes. So presumably, if you looked at all the species and all the plots combined, at least maybe in the future, you would expect the total regional diversity to, to decline. Um, yes, that's especially true for the alpine tundra, because there are, first of all, there's a much higher diversity to start with, and they're mm -hmm. much less widely distributed than the Arctic species. So the Arctic species have typically already passed through some sort of filter, and the ones that made it to the Arctic tend, tend to be actually quite widespread. Mm. Um, and so they are not usually, with some exceptions, they're not usually at risk of immediate extinction. But definitely as things get warmer and, you know, even if the diversity of these areas increases, we definitely expect to lose specific species that are associated with these cold regions because they have nowhere else to go. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? You can raise your hand or write in the chat. We can take questions afterwards as well. So if you have something but you haven't really thought of it yet, we can take it a bit later. Um, okay, so I think we're going to say Anne, thank you very much. And you're going to be with us for the rest of the evening, I hope. So we might have some more questions for you uh, mm -hmm. later on. Um, so yeah, James, um, I'm really happy that you could join us from Belgium. So this is a good thing with, with COVID-19 that we can have these digital events and you can join us from, from Belgium. Um, otherwise, we might not have had you here. I don't know. Um, you're very welcome to be here tonight and uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Um, yes, can you see my correct screen? I, I see your PowerPoint presentation, not the... Yes, and now... Oh, okay, now. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, so, Thanks very much for yeah for organizing this and for having for having us. Uh, my name is James. I'm a PhD student in the Marine Science Department at the University of Gothenburg, and yeah, my background is in a, a sort of a wide range of ecology and biodiversity, and I am really looking at functional ecology as well at the moment. Um, but today I'm not really focusing too much on my own work, but I'm going to talk a little bit more generally about extinctions and ecosystem changes in the ocean. So I think I'll just get started. Um, so I'll just stick with the, the Jenga metaphor because that was the, the metaphor of the day. And I'm sure that we would all agree that all the Jenga pieces are somewhat important for the overall stability of the tower. But then I'm sure we would also agree that some are more important than others. So for example, this one would be a sort of simple and solid. And if you removed it, probably not much would happen as Ola said in the beginning. But this is not necessarily the case for all tiles. And I think we would all agree that if you moved removed this tile, um, things would change. And so this tile is really critical to the overall stability of the system. And now a sort of major discovery that occurred in marine ecology in the last 50 years or so is that like the very important individual Jenga tiles, the loss of just one or maybe a few species in marine food webs like this one can cause quite substantial changes in the state and functioning of ecosystems. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So this idea that one species could strongly affect ecosystems was first discovered by someone named Robert Payne. 
And Robert Payne was interested in how ecosystems responded to predation. So, for example, he was interested in how predators like wolves might maintain vegetation states in forest. But it was, of course, quite difficult to study this at this time. It's not that easy to sort of remove wolves from one area and then keep them in another and sort of observe what happens over time. These experiments were not really, were not really possible then or, or now, really. But on a trip to Washington State in the US, he came across a slightly more modest ecosystem. And this was the sort of rocky intertidal zone in, in the region. And what he found there was a different ferocious predator, and this one was a bit easier to handle. So this is a very large predatory starfish um, called Pisaster ochreaceus. And let me tell you, these starfish are pretty big. So this species can get up to 35 centimeters in diameter. And for a typical Swedish comparison, the size of your typical cinnamon bun is about 10 centimeters. So for most of you, it's about the size of your computer screen. So that's how big these, these things can get. And they feed on a variety of different organisms, uh, mostly hard-bodied organisms like mussels, barnacles, and snails. And the way they do this is they eject their stomach and squeeze it inside the shells of these species. And then they digest it and kind of suck it out like a soup. So if you're a, if you're a mussel, these starfish can be, can be quite ferocious. Um, but back to Robert Payne's experiments and sort of what he realized is that he could quite easily manipulate these starfish. I mean, they were pretty slow. So he found that he could remove them from one area and then leave them in other areas and sort of observe what happened over time. So that's what he did. So he went to a patch of rocky shore that kind of looks like this. And on this rocky shore, he counted the number of space filling species. So these are just species that sort of occupy area on the rocks. So this could be like this green anemone, which is a quite spectacular species in the region. Um, it could be something like this brown algae, or it could be something like this mussel, which is quite similar to what we get on the Swedish coastline, actually. He then went to a different but very similar rocky shore, and he counted all the species again, and then he removed all the starfish. So he just got rid of them. And specifically, he would go back to the site twice a month uh, with a crowbar, and then he would like lodge them free and toss them back into the sea. And this is a direct quote from the article he published in 1974. So starfish were removed manually from the north area. They were hurled back into the water, usually 20 to 40 meters from the experimental area. So I don't think you would see many statements like this in the scientific literature today, but I found it quite amusing to, to read these papers again. Um, and on the left is a picture of Robert Payne removing his starfish in 1974, having a great time. And this is him more recently doing the same thing. So 40 years later, he was still chucking starfish back into the water. Uh, he passed away a few years ago now. Um, I'm from South Africa and I actually grew up on very similar rocky shores. So a lot of my childhood was spent here and I did some of my own rocky shore experiments over the years. So. Um, I have this ecosystem is very close to my my heart. Um, but the results of this simple experiment were quite spectacular and it's become a sort of cornerstone of modern ecological experiments. Um, and the results are shown here on this graph. I don't know, can you all see my pointer? Is that good? Yeah, so on the y axis here, you have the number of species that he counted. And on the x axis here, you have the presence of starfish. And then here is where starfish were removed. And as you can see, where starfish were removed, there was a decline of 13 species. So the areas with starfish had 15 species, and where the starfish were removed, there were only two left over. And what he also observed was that the whole dominant structure of the ecosystem changed. So I've illustrated this with different colors. So the different colors are just different species. And over here, where the starfish were removed, the area became dominated completely by mussels. Whereas where the starfish were still present, there were a range of different species present. So barnacles, mussels, some red crustose coralline algae. So basically, the rocky shore went from something that looked like this, a diverse assemblage of different species, to a low diversity mussel dominated shoreline that looked like this. And this was just through the removal of, of one species. So what 
the results of this experiment showed was that one starfish species or one species in general could have these considerable influences on how ecosystems work and the state of the ecosystem. But of course, many questions still remained. So did this apply to other ecosystems? Can we predict which species are important? But soon after Robert Payne published his work, um, the evidence for these sort of destabilizing effects that single species can have in ecosystems started to accumulate. And um, it became quite clear that these extinctions can have far reaching consequences. And some of the first sort of warning signs of this, um, that this destabilization can occur, came from the Aleutian Islands. So these are a small chain of islands off the Alaskan Peninsula. And in the 1990s, researchers were resurveying biological communities in kelp forests on these islands to compare with previous surveys done 10 years before that. And what they found was quite surprising and, and startling. So this is just a graph of kelp abundance on the y-axis here. So kelp are these big brown algaes, and this is time on the x-axis. So when the kelp forests were surveyed in 1987, kelp was very abundant. But when they resurveyed things again in 1997, they found this dramatic decline in kelp density on these islands. And what they also observed was a massive increase in the density of sea urchins. So sea urchins are these spiky things that eat algae. And the urchin biomass here is shown on the y-axis, and then this is time again. And yeah, so with this kelp decline, we saw this massive increase in urchins. So what was happening is that ecosystems that once looked like this were shifting to something that looked more like this. So from these surveys, the picture was quite clear. Urchins are known to feed on kelp, and they were clearly destroying these forests. And I'll just show this quick video. So kelp attached to substrate using something called a holdfast. So this is this point here that they attach to. And this is just a video of uh, sea urchins devouring this kelp holdfast. And even though they look pretty slow, this is obviously sped up, uh, they can pretty much destroy an entire kelp forest by dislodging the adult kelp and over time, these kelp will just float away and the urchins will dominate uh, the ecosystem. So the picture was kind of clear that the urchins were destroying the kelp, but it wasn't clear why the urchins had increased in abundance so much. Um, but what previous work on these islands had shown is that on islands where otters were present, uh, sea urchin density was much lower than where otters were absent. So this had been shown uh, previously. So they had some clues, like potentially this was uh, due to otter changes. And indeed, otters are well known to eat urchins. This is a nice picture of an otter, like just devouring one of these spiky things. Um, so it seemed likely that some sort of release from otter predation was driving these increases. And indeed, when the researchers then looked at the data on otter abundance, it revealed clearly that the otters on the different islands had declined uh, a lot in the previous 10 or 20 years. So this is just time on the x-axis again, and this is otter abundance on the y-axis, and the different colors are different islands. And you can see for this island, the data go quite far back, and you can see a massive decline, and then these are more recent surveys, but all show that otters had declined a lot. So. It seemed quite clear that the collapse of the kelp forests um, due to urchin grazing was driven by a collapse in the otter populations. And what gave the final clue to this whole story was the observation that orcas or killer whales had started feeding on otters in the region. So actually, orcas didn't typically feed on otters. Um, they were mostly seal predators, but for some reason they had started to, to eat these, these otters. So, the picture was pretty clear, and I've sort of illustrated this in this diagram. So orcas are typically feeding on seals. Um, this means that the otter abundance is quite high. They can maintain the sea urchin population, which allows the kelp forest to thrive, and you get a sort of ecosystem state that looks like this. But then what happened is that the seal populations started to decline. And they think that that was due to overfishing. So seals eat fish, and the seals were now in competition with the fishing industry. The seal population started decline, declining, and the killer whales switched their prey to otters. 
And once this happened, the otters population started to decline and they started to go locally extinct in some regions, which then led to an explosion of the urchin population, which completely degraded the kelp forests. And then you get an ecosystem state that's something like this. So basically this one species loss could drive these um, quite spectacular changes in the ecosystem. And this is just a map um, which was published quite recently where all of these different purple dots are areas where this sort of ecosystem shift has been main, um, has been observed in some form or other. Sometimes the changes can be very widespread, sometimes they can be more localized. But in all these cases, there's been a switch from a kelp to an urchin barren, and then sometimes back to kelp, or just kelp to an urchin barren in general. So this is a, a highly widespread phenomenon. And now, despite how widespread this process is, um, the consequences of these changes are not fully understood. And for exa an example of why we don't fully understand the consequences comes from this Stella sea cow. So Stella sea cow is an extinct species that's closely related to the modern day dugongs and manatees. And actually it was for a long time held up as kind of the unfortunate poster child of human driven extinction. So for a long time, it was assumed that humans just hunted these completely to extinction. But Stella sea cow feeds on kelp and other algae, and there's been a sort of reinterpretation of the Stella sea cow story recently. Um, what researchers now think is that otter declines shifted kelp ecosystems to these urchin dominated states, which led to the food source of these Stella sea cows collapsing. So actually, even without human hunting, these uh, creatures would have been going extinct anyway, just because of the loss of these food resources in this different ecosystem state. So Basically, these changes can have a whole wide variety of unexpected consequences that are very difficult to predict. And actually, you can still go see a skeleton of Stella sea cow in the Vienna Natural History Museum, which is definitely worth doing um, sometime. And this is just a comparison of um, biomass in these different ecosystem states. So this is a recent paper also done in the Aleutian Islands, which compares biomass or sort of productivity in kelp forests compared to these urchin barrens. And what's quite clear is that these urchin barrens support much less productivity than the kelp forests. So basically these urchin dominated systems can cause these extinctions and they generally lead to a depauperization of the ecosystem in terms of function. So just to summarize, uh, in many marine ecosystems, the loss of just one or maybe a few species can have these dramatic effects on the ecosystem state. For example, the otter declines that I showed shift a kelp forest uh, to an urchin dominated barren state. And then these sort of ecosystem shifts have a whole host of indirect consequences, like species extinction of Stella sea that I showed, and these sort of ecosystem function consequences, like the decline in productivity over time. So just to end uh, my presentation, we also know that many marine species are currently under threat. So in the last sort of 500 years, there have been 20 recorded marine species extinctions. Um, there's probably been a lot more that we don't know about, and it's actually quite difficult to determine whether a species is or isn't extinct. But 20, so 20 is a very conservative estimate. But we also know that we've assessed about 13,000 marine species for extinction risk. Um, and what we find is that we think about 9% are at serious risk of extinction in sort of the next 100 years or so. And what's particularly worrying about this is that these extinctions or the extinction risk at least appears to be biased towards functionally important species. So this is not a great uh, graph to read, I'll admit it, but FUSE score on the y-axis here uh, just means how functionally unique and specialized a species is. And redder colors indicate a greater risk of extinction. So what you see here is that usually the species that are at greater risk of extinction also are more functionally unique and functionally important. So given all the evidence that I've showed you that just the loss of one single important species can have such extreme effects on ecosystems, it seems likely that greater extinctions in these uh, functionally important species will have a lot of unintended consequences in marine systems in the future. So, Thanks very much for listening. That's all I have to say. And I see I'm slightly over time, but <laughs> hopefully it was okay. Um, so thank you.
Uh, thank you so much, James. Um, and I, I'm, I was smiling here because I was writing my notes when you started talking about otters and sea urchins and kelp. It's like, yes, stellar sea cow. And the story, and then you brought it up. Uh, so yay. Um, because we also have a skeleton from Stella Sea Cow here at the Gotham Natural History Museum. It's not a complete skeleton, but we have, uh, well, bits and pieces, not big pieces of it, and uh, <laughs> maybe from different individuals. We don't really know that. And this story about the otters being hunted, uh, so there were more sea urchins and less kelp, and this uh, Stella Sea Cow, they start, that's a story that we actually have uh, written about now we we are renovating here at the museum so that story will be part of our new exhibition oh very nice so, <laughs> okay. that was very i'm very happy about that um and your question there in the beginning like can we predict which species are important uh well no uh and i mean that's why we have to preserve all of the species we can't we can't say that yeah why do we need like thousands of different species of bugs yeah, because we do, because we don't know what's going to happen if half of them disappear. So even one, it might be just the wrong one. So we have to be careful about every species that we have. Um, do we have any more questions right now? Okay. Anne. <laughs> I'm just curious about the, the sea urchins. So they eat the kelp. Then what happens when the kelp is gone what do they eat then and how do they manage to maintain such a high abundance yeah it's a good it's a good question but so what generally happens is the kelp like floats away because they like detach it um, and then the ecosystem becomes dominated by these so i mean some other algae grows there still like smaller algae and then they eat those very quickly um, so it's basically just like a constant amount of these like ephemeral algae. i as far as i understand it from the system is that Algae still grows there, just not the kelps, and they eat those pretty quickly. So what happens is they it, the system is dominated by these like red crusty algae and the sea urchins, and then whenever something pops up, it just gets eaten uh, quickly. So I had never pictured sea urchins as such um, <laughs> predators before. <laughs> um, so much you don't know. Um, okay, um, Christine Bacon couldn't be with us tonight, um, but I have a recording from her, so she's still going to be with us in a way, so I'm going to share my screen and her video. So that's the third and last talk, or maybe fourth, if we count Ola in the beginning, of course. Um, so I'm going to show that, and then we have time for some more questions and a discussion. Um, okay, let's see if I can do this correctly. Can you all see this one? Yeah. Okay. Hi everyone. Thanks for participating in this event. I had to pre-record my lecture because today is actually my birthday. So I'm going to be with family and friends um, while you are all discussing um, this interesting topic. But um, I'd like to share my screen with you now and quickly present myself. Um, my name is uh, Christine Bacon and I'm an associate professor at the University of Gothenburg in biodiversity. I've been working on uh, tropical plant diversity for over uh, 20 years, actually, when I first saw rainforests in Brazil during university. And my research focuses on tropical plant evolution and the formation of tropical forests through time and space. So I'll be contributing uh, to the discussion today by presenting some information about rainforest collapse. So to begin, I'd like to get on the same page about uh, what uh, rainforests are. So they're characterized as tropical and subtropical moist broadleaf forests. And they're generally found centered on the equator 
and between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. They're characterized by low variation in temperature throughout the year and have high levels of rainfall. And they're also dominated by semi-evergreen and evergreen deciduous trees. And so rainforests are fundamentally important they harbor a disproportionate amount of biodiversity per square meter of Earth's surface. We can see here, indicated in lighter colors on the world map, the levels of alpha diversity or uh, biodiversity at uh, global scales. It, rainforests are found in regions that also hold the highest values of global natural capital. So if we're to put an actual dollar sign or value per hectare of land, the highest global values are seen here in these warmer colors found in tropical areas. The issue is, is that it's these regions of the highest forest cover seen here in green that are also those areas that are experiencing the highest levels of forest loss. So as indicated here in these red colors. And not only it does habitat and species loss form a fundamental importance for society and for us here uh, today, um, but we also have a moral responsibility to maintain diversity as best we can. Humans depend on biodiversity for ecosystem services, but also for numerous and unknown untapped potential. Rainforests are being greatly affected by humans. Current understanding is that human activities have the potential to actually push the Earth system past critical states into completely different modes, which would imply large scale impacts on human and ecological systems. These phenomena have been described as tipping points followed by this notion that at a particular moment in time, a small change can have a large long-term consequences for a system. Like the idea that little things can make a big difference. So some examples that have received recent intention, attention include a tundra loss, which Ann Bjorkman likely presented on earlier this evening, and dieback of the Amazon forest which I'll be discussing today. So Amazonia is indeed the land of superlatives. At almost 7 million kilometers squared, it's the largest remaining tropical forest on Earth. It also harbors 10% of Earth's total biodiversity. Specifically, it is found in the center of South America. And the region is split uh, colloquially into three regions, the west, the center, and the eastern portions. And these are broadly defined by their soil structure and landscape history, which in turn affects the uh, floristic composition or the species diversity in these different areas. Amazonia is under threat. Media coverage of the recent fires have increased public awareness of intense land use changes throughout South America, especially in Amazonia. So almost 1 million hectares were lost to fire in 2019, which I'm showing here in these satellite images of burning fires, where most of these fires have been occurring in, within the political borders of Brazil. Uh, so this is significant because deforestation degrades the hydrological cycle. We know that vegetation is not a silent actor in climate change, but rather it's known that forests have strong feedback with climate and actually change climate independently through aspects of the hydrological cycle. 
rainforests regulate global climate because they're carbon sinks. And forests absorb carbon dioxide from the air, which, for example, offsets the fossil fuel emissions that we're currently pumping into the atmosphere. Rainforests also mediate regional climate. And they do this by enhancing atmospheric moisture recycling and thereby enhance rainfall levels at seasonal and annual scales. So Amazonia generates half of its own rainfall through this recycling process. So when trees photosynthesize, they extract soil or moisture, soil moisture or groundwater and then they release it into the atmosphere. So from early works on the hydrological cycle of Amazonia, um, the fundamental question arose even back then about how much deforestation would be required to actually cause the entire cycle to degrade to the point of being unable to support rainforests. So this has been, um, a major focus of study in recent years, this idea of a tipping point in Amazonia. So tropical forests modify the conditions they depend on through these feedbacks that I was just mentioning, thereby controlling their own resilience to deforestation in response to climate change. At a local scale, you can either have a fully covered forest, which is shown in this figure here in green, or a sparsely covered non-forest, like a grassland or a savanna, shown here in red. So this pattern of these two different forest types is consistent across the tropics. It's not specific to Amazonia. And it's also consistent across a range of different climates. Therefore, it's not explained by environmental variables. Instead, this forest cover bimodality is understood as a result of locally acting feedback processes that can generate stable states or unstable states. So disturbances such as this here in yellow it can make the system tip where fires are the most likely mechanism that make a tropical forest tip to this state of low forest cover. A stability landscape of forest cover is shown here in the bottom of this figure against rainfall values. At high rainforest values, high forest cover shown here in green is stable. At intermediate rainfall levels, um, these high forest cover and low forest cover systems are unstable states. And at low rainfall levels, only the non-forested state can exist here in red. So when we take this all together, we find that tropical forests sh actually shape their own distributions and create the climatic conditions that enable them. This same study by Stahl et al. published uh, just a few months ago mapped forest distributions of recent climate like current climate and projected distributions into future climactic scenarios here, the late 21st century. So here we can see both the minimum distribution of rain of rainforests and in green and maximum or maximum forest distributions in this orange beige color. So um, what we can see is that in future climate, we can see shifts in this distribution of tropical forests um, due to climate change. This, this study uh, identified these shifts in forest potential, where these red areas show loss. These are stable forests under the current climate, but cross a tipping point into this non-forested rainfall range under future or 21st century climate. The blue areas shown here in this shift in forest potential 
represent gains in tropical forests. So right now in current climate, they're too dry for forests to exist under, under current climate regimes, but they cross a tipping point to a stable forest rainfall range under the late 21st century climate. So we can actually see expansion of rainforests through time. So taken together, this study shows that this feedback between forest, tropical rainforest and rainfall expands the geographic range of forest distributions. And that's shown especially in Amazonia. With this, the authors of this paper then suggest that Amazonia could partially recover from deforestation, but nonetheless, it would, it would lose resilience to climate change it, later in this century. This resilience to climate change is directly related to temperature sensitivity of forests. So about 40% of the world's vegetation carbon resides in rainforests. Old growth forests in Amazonia store carbon in their biomass and through photosynthesis and respiration, they process carbon at more than twice the rate of anthropogenic fossil fuel emissions. So relatively small changes in the Amazon forest therefore can have the potential to substantially affect the concentration of atmospheric CO2 and thus the rate of climate change itself. So this figure that I'm showing you here from this study showed that the maximum temperature um, is the most important predictor of above ground biomass. So primarily by reducing um, woody productivity and has a greater impact in per Celsius degree in the hottest levels of, um, in the hottest forests found globally. So that carbon loss though, depends on the strength of CO2 effects. And that's what they're showing in the bottom portion of these different maps. So these are different CO2 effects. And th it's these, this carbon loss, uh, depending on the strength of CO CO2 effects can Im actually improve the negative effects of increasing temperature due to climate change on biomass carbon stocks. So here we can see that in Amazonia, these carbon stocks are predicted to decline even under the strongest CO2 effects uh, considered. So Amazonia is certainly under threat, especially when you compare to other rainforests, which have these cooler bluer colors showing that the change in carbon stock is less extreme. So this resilience to climate change is also related to drought resistance. Here we can see a net biomass change measured in Amazonia since the year 1980. So this data collected in year 2000, oops, excuse me, in year 2000 and 2005 showed a stark reversal of a large long-term carbon sink. And this reversal coincides or coincided with an unusually intense drought event, an intense dry season. So with these results, the authors suggest that the exceptional growth in atmospheric CO2 concentrations in the year 2005 coincided with the third greatest uh, in the global record, and that it may have been partially caused by this Amazonian uh, drought event shown here. Um, also recently uh, summarized in the journal Science Advances, these authors um, suggested that this Amazonian tipping point could be related to two major um, statistics. First of all, that exactly four degrees Celsius of global warming would be the tipping point in Amazonia to degraded savannas and that it is the negative synergies between different factors, deforestation, climate change, and fire, that would indicate that this tipping point would occur at about 20 to 25% at deforestation in the region. So this is all hugely serious 
not just for global climate and Earth's biodiversity, but for human society and for us here today. And for that, then, you're likely wondering what you could do. And certainly, you've begun this process. You're here. We're all thinking, what can we do? And you're educating yourself, and hopefully you'll do that with those around you, which is really a good first step on what we can do about um, rainforest collapse, particularly in Amazonia. Other ideas that have been presented about what we can do to avoid rainforest collapse is to buy and protect land, to support indigenous communities, to reduce consumption, to hold the businesses that we rely on accountable for their choices. We can vote and we can even get involved politically. And it's important to remember that it's not all doom and gloom and that there have been numerous successes in the international community towards um, stopping deforestation and potential rainforest collapse. For example, there are major success stories in Costa Rica, Mexico, and Vietnam, some of our most diverse rainforests on earth, um, where intergovernment uh, intergovernment payments are being made for ecosystem services. Development projects are being stopped in their tracks. For example, the Triburga port that was proposed in the Choco rainforest of Colombia. And there's also lots of new educational material that's very important for us in moving forward and advancing our knowledge and understanding of the processes related to rainforest collapse. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention today. And if you have any questions, please do not um, uh, hesitate to reach out to me at any time. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Bye. OK, let's see if I can go back to, um, yeah. Here I am again. So we, I have to write to Christine tomorrow and say thank you um, for her talk there. Um, at least we get some good news from Christine. That was nice. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, there are good things happening. Um, so I want to bring back James and Anne a little bit uh, first. OK, so um, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, do you think we can fix this? Do you have, are you positive for the future or <laughs> how are you feeling with your research and what do you see in your data? I would say um, certainly for the areas that I study, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there are, there will be a certain amount of change still, even if we stop, you know, using carbon right now, there, there's still a certain momentum that will keep going. But I think it's still at the point where it's not catastrophic yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would I would agree. Um, I mean, it's getting there in some places. But what I what I like to see um, is that in many countries like like Christine just presented, like in Amazonia, there's still a lot of deforestation going on, and in many other places. And this is true, and this needs to, well, we need at least some way to reduce this. But I think what's also nice is that natural habitat is also coming back in a lot of places. So actually in Europe and North America, for example, there's a lot of afforestation, like new forestation, and people are getting much uh, more um, willing to accept the idea of sort of rewilding ecosystems and bringing people uh, closer to these things. So I would say it's definitely not all doom and gloom. And if we just look at, as I said, I presented 20 marine extinctions. So that's not that many, I would say. And there's probably been way more, but it just shows that actually there's a, still a big opportunity to make sure we don't lose more than that, I would say. So. Thank you. Uh, I mean, we do live in an age where we can buy everything we want from the internet sitting on the bus home or lying in bed in the evening and we consume so many things that we don't need really need we want a lot of things um, and we are all connected but this also gives us a possibility and an opportunity to actually 
get together in a way that we couldn't before. Um, I mean, we're not even in the same country, all of us right now, but we can still talk to each other and we can get a message across really easily nowadays. So even if it seems very um, gray and gloomy sometimes, we do have the opportunity to make ourselves heard uh, and to get others to join us. And I think that's a really good thing with the world we live in today. Um, yeah, we have a bit over 15 minutes left if we have more questions. If anyone wants to write in the chat or maybe say something, you can just turn your microphone on. Now it's really hard sometimes to actually figure the questions out right away. So uh, if you realize tomorrow morning, like, yeah, oh my God, I forgot to ask this, or I just um, came to think of this. So you can just uh, maybe write on Facebook in the event um, and uh, I will questions from there. Um, James and Anne, do you have anything else that you would like to discuss with us here tonight when you have us at your mercy? <laughs> well, I just I had thought about something regarding what James said um, and this, this concept of doom and gloom, which is that I actually find it quite um, helpful to think about the many cases in which humans are actually good for diversity. So there's actually many examples of, of humans creating habitats that are good for diversity. So a lot of these sort of rare species that we value are actually in part, um, they evolved in part because of, of humans, in part because of an anthropogenic influence. Uh, and even here in Sweden, some of, the, some of the species that are endangered are endangered as a result of not enough management. So there are these species that are associated with edge habitats between forests and fields, for example, that are declining um, if if there's no sort of disturbance of the landscape. So it's not that humans always have to be bad for diversity. We can be good for diversity. Um, and I think that's important to remember that, you know, we shouldn't just give up and say it's either humans or biodiversity. We have to choose because it can, we can have both and, and we can be a positive um, influence on diversity. It just, we just have to at, at the right level. You have to act at the right level. Yeah, I mean, we have the possibility to, to do a lot of good. Uh, we have the technologies, we have the, the knowledge. We just, we just have to do it and, and get the right people to, uh, to do it, to listen to us and uh, to agree to do it. So yeah, um, I'm quite happy right now with this <laughs> evening. It's been so interesting to listen to uh, to you and to Ola and uh, Christine. Uh, and I hope Christine has a nice birthday. <laughs> um, and I don't have anything else to add unless there are something from anyone here. No. So we might actually end a little bit early and we can all go back to watching Netflix. Nah. Or go out and enjoy the amazing dark autumn evening weather in Sweden. Maybe try and listen to some birds or bats. Light some I candles. Know someone. Yeah, light some candles, drink some tea, <laughs> and think about what we can do better tomorrow to preserve all the species and the forest that we need. Okay, yeah. I'm looking at my colleague now, Pradika, to see if she's happy with the evening. And she is. <laughs> Thumbs up. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone that joined us this evening. Um, and I hope that we get to see each other in person someday. And that we can do something more together in the future. And um, we have recorded this evening and we will put it on our website when we have had the time to get the subtitles ready um, so more people can watch it then so please uh, talk to your friends because uh, this has been very frightening at least for me uh, and i think more people can enjoy it so thank you so much uh, and i hope we see each other again soon thanks thanks yeah. bye bye